The program will begin shortly, so please find a seat at this time. And a reminder, too, to please silence your cell phones and other devices. Our program will start in just a few minutes. Our program is about to begin, so please take your seats at this time. And once again, a friendly reminder to silence your cell phones and other devices. Thank you.
please give a warm welcome to the Augsburg University Chamber Strings who will be performing Andante Festivo by John Sibelius.
Please welcome to the stage Hall of Famer and longtime TV and radio broadcaster, Mark Rosen. Well, good morning, Minnesota. How's everyone doing? Welcome to the historic Fitzgerald Theater in St. Paul. I'm Mark Rosen, as you just heard. And I'm honored to be your MC, you know, and I was talking to the governor. I so badly wanted to offer up a good-natured jab at the, our Packer fans out there. But alas, um, maybe we'll see you again in the playoffs if you make them. Um, okay, that's it. No more. That's as political as I'm going to get today. Uh, well, whether you're here in St. Paul or you're joining us from home, uh, this is a moment to celebrate coming together as one Minnesota. We're here today to take part in a sacred tradition of our democracy. Every four years, Minnesotans vote, and I mean they lead the nation in voting. <laughs> and that, of course, is to elect the people who will represent us at the state capitol. Today we mark the beginning of a new year, and with that comes a transition from one administration to the next. Today we will officially swear in Minnesota's constitutional officers to a second term. With that, I'd like to invite our official party to take their seats on stage, Judge Jerry Blackwell. Judge, <laughs> Judge Sarah Gruing. Associate Justice Barry Anderson. <laughs> Judge Sarah Wheelock. <laughs> Judge Jonathan Judd. <laughs> Attorney General Keith Ellison. State Auditor, Julie Blaha. <laughs> Secretary of State, Steve Simon. <laughs> Our Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan. and Minnesota's 41st Governor, Tim Walls. At this time, please stand for the Minnesota Tribal Honor Guards presented by Boys Fort Band of Chippewa, Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Grand Portage Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe, Lower Sioux Indian Community, Mille Lacs Band of Ojibwe, Prairie Island Indian Community, Red Lake Band of Chippewa, Shakopee Mittawakanton Sioux Community, Upper Sioux Community, and White Earth Nation. Please welcome to the stage Sharon Day, Ojibwe, Executive Director, Indigenous Peoples Task Force. Ojibwe, 
Dewey, my Gani Doug, Nagamo, my Ingen, and Indishnikaz. Excuse me. Nagamo, my Ingen, Indishnikaz, Wabasheshi, and Dodem, Ojibwe, Kwe, and Dow, Dishnejo, Madeo, Made, Wana, Kwe, and Dow. Um, honored, honored to be here, and I'm going to sing a prayer song. And this prayer song says, um, welcomes the four directions, says thank you in the most profound way to the earth, to the sky, and um, for all of our lives. And it also says um, uh, thank you again in the most profound way to all of our grandmothers going back to the beginning of time, and to our grandfathers back to the beginning of time, and then finally to that most kind creator, Gijay Manadu. And now please remain standing for the presentation of the colors by the Minnesota National Guard Honor Guard. Please welcome to the stage Jess Davis, 2019 Teacher of the Year and current Racial Equity Instructional Coach for the St. Louis Park School District to sing our national anthem. Skies, 
Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars Through the perilous fight O'er the ramparts we watched Were so gallantly streaming And the rockets rang And now, please welcome to the stage students from the Minnesota Urban Debate League, a program of Augsburg University, as they lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And now, please welcome to the stage Minnesota's own Poet Laureate, Gwen Nell Westerman. Good, thank you. Ami <laughs> Takiapi, Dead Dakota Makoche, Ka Dead Wichahapi. Hena Wexie Ampetu Kinde, dead Nawaji, Dakota Wia, Hemacha, Hem, my Yu Yokbe. Those words are from my ancestors, so I'm not going to translate them for you because they know what I said. In this moment, we stand on the threshold between history and the future with a clear view of the past, its successes and its mistakes, its achievements and false starts. What we had hoped in our hearts that we would have what it takes and our dreams would be surpassed, not later, but sooner. That we would recognize the debt owed to those who stood on the threshold before us. They may have been fewer, but if we could have asked them, would we have what it takes to survey our history 
for what it imparts, how it shapes our memories and sparks our creativity and even breaks down the walls that hold fast our ability to see possibilities of newer opportunities for us to then hold the authority to step across the threshold and see a vision for the future that can take shape at last. For we do have what it takes, a profound longing in our hearts that will rise in an arc, enabling us to acknowledge our mistakes with a clear view of the past and of those who stood on the threshold before us as we step into the future. Thank you. Please be seated. Please welcome to the stage students from the Prior Lake High School Low Brass Ensemble. They'll be performing Simple Gifts, arranged by Mike Forbes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Please welcome to the stage Imam Makram El Amin of Masjid Anur. We began as traditional for Muslims, Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim, that is, with God's name, the merciful benefactor, the merciful redeemer. And I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. The heart. How is your heart? A question that we should be asking ourselves frequently, especially those of us who are called to serve others. Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, peace be upon him, is recorded to have said that verily in the body there's a piece of flesh. If it is sound, the whole body is sound. And if it is corrupted, the entire body is corrupted. Verily that piece of flesh, it is the heart. And further, he says, wealth is in the heart, as poverty is in the heart. Whoever is wealthy in their hearts will not be harmed by any matter that happens in the world. Whoever is impoverished in the heart will not be satisfied with no matter how much they have in the world. Verily, they will only be harmed by the greed that is in their souls. As an intimate prayer in the text of the Quran, God says, Our Lord, let not our hearts deviate after you have guided us aright, and grant us mercy from your own presence, for you are the one who gives without measuring. On this beautiful occasion, to all of our leaders, we pray to God to make our hearts sound, content, and rightly guided. Amen. Thank you, Imam El Amin. We now turn to the portion of the event that we've all been waiting for. Judge Jerry Blackwell, I'll turn it over to you to administer Attorney General Keith Ellison's oath of office alongside his family. I, Keith Ellison, I, Keith Ellison, do solemnly affirm, do solemnly affirm, that I will support, that I will support, the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and that I will discharge faithfully, and I will discharge faithfully, the duties of the Office of Minnesota Attorney General, the duties of the Office of the Office of Minnesota Attorney General, to the best of my judgment and ability, 
to the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. Let me start by just pointing out to you that Judge Jerry Blackwell has completed his first official act as a judge today. <clears throat> And, and judge, judge, you did a great job. It's rare that a lawyer gets to thank the judge for doing a good job, but today I'm gonna, I'm gonna take that opportunity. Hey there, friends. What an honor, what a pleasure. Thank you all so much for being here. When we stood before you four years ago, and by we, I mean my fellow constitutional officers, uh, almost all of us were new, except for our amazing Secretary of State, Steve Simon. He had some experience. He had some job experience, but we were new. Uh, and yet, we were so excited, full of hope, full of aspiration for this state we love so much. Four years ago, I came here before you to share my vision of a just and fair economy and society in which all Minnesotans can afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. I told you then the story of how Alex Smith lost his life because he couldn't afford his insulin. In fact, because he couldn't afford his insulin, he couldn't afford his life. And I vowed to help Minnesotans afford their lives. I said, I said, Alec and his amazing mother, Nicole, would inspire me to help Minnesotans afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. And we did. He did inspire me, and she inspired me. And in the last four years, I want to say the legislature, they passed the Alex Smith Emergency Insulin Act. <clears throat> but not long. Not long after the legislature did their job, Big Pharma attacked the law in court, and your attorney general's office went to work to defend it in court, and so far we have won every step of the way. Anytime anyone tries to keep either the cost of insulin or affording your life, out of the reach of Minnesotans, you can bet your Attorney General's office will step up and fight for Minnesotans. In the last four years, we've also held those people who manufacture, distribute opioids accountable because that crisis has cost such a toll on Minnesota families. It sparked the, infant, uh, the fentanyl crisis, which is wreaking havoc. We will continue to be on the front line fighting to help Minnesotans get the resources they need to be well and safe. We've, we've gone to court a lot of times, standing up for Minnesotans against people who would rip them off, take advantage of them, sell them products that would harm their health, including Fleet Farm, including Juul, and including companies that pollute our earth and cause climate damage to our society and, our, and, our, and, the, and the world we live in. We've gotten back millions from 
uh, those who would defraud Minnesotans from student loans and many other areas. And we fought for economic security for women and to protect farmers and rural communities from monopoly. And we're ready to do much, much more. <clears throat> but four years ago, friends, four years ago, we didn't know, I didn't know what was coming our way. None of us did. There was the worst global pandemic in a century. Not since 1917 had we seen what we just went through and continue to go through. Four years ago, my mother was in the audience today. And I believe she's still in this audience, even though we have had to say goodbye to her in this earthly place. Today, she's not here with us, and I know that I'm so grateful that my family has been able to come here today to be with me. Uh, I want to thank all of them, but special thanks to those who have come from afar to be here, including my brother, Reverend Brian Ellison, his wife Sharon, and their son, Nehemiah. Thank you all for being here. And when it comes to this pandemic, let me tell you, we didn't know, but your, your, your executive council had to meet nearly several times a week to try to make decisions to keep Minnesotans safe with imperfect information. But we stood up and we did our very best under the leadership of our governor, Tim Walls. <clears throat> and for us, it is personal. It's personal for me. It's also very personal for our Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, who lost her brother, a wonderful man. We know what it means when Minnesotans cried out for us to make the best decisions we could to protect people from the COVID disease. And then there was the murder of George Floyd that focused the world's attention on Minnesota and sparked a nationwide, even worldwide, racial reckoning. There was a spike in violent crime that came as a result of the pandemic, and there was an economic inequality that was exacerbated because of it. There was the U.S. Supreme Court's decision to overturn 50 years of subtle law that guaranteed the right to choose. And on January 6th, we witnessed the biggest assault on democracy since the Civil War. Governor Walls and I saw that as an attack on our colleagues and our former place of business, our U.S. Capitol. But we rose to the challenge. We stepped up and we gave it all we had. We kept people and communities safe from violence and a virus. We successfully protected our democracy. Special thanks to Steve Simon for that. We stood up. <clears throat> we stood up for the right to choose and for our most personal freedoms. And in prosecuting the people who killed George Floyd, we showed that no one is above the law and no one is beneath the law. We believe in equal justice before the law. Today I come before you to pledge to continue the work that we started four years ago and to do it together. I come to you with a renewed sense of vigor and commitment plus four years of experience, which God willing brings some wisdom along with it. In these four years, I will keep on working to help Minnesotans afford their lives and live with dignity, safety, and respect. And that means a few things specifically. Fighting inflation by stopping price gouging and anti-competitive behavior and unconscionable drug prices and wage theft. <clears throat> Continuing to fight for fair competition in our economy, including by investigating every merger and acquisition, including the Fairview Sanford merger, from the perspective of what's right for Minnesota. From continuing the fight against the fentanyl crisis and holding those accountable who would unconsciously, negligently poison our communities. And by continuing to fight for our democracy, our right to choose, and our most cherished freedoms. And it means standing up for a Minnesotan's right to be safe Everyone has the right to be safe, which starts with our right to not be shot. 
we will use our wide range of, of authorities uh, to protect Minnesotans uh, in the criminal justice system, but also by using civil tools as well. I'll never forget when a little more than a year ago, my friend Mayor Melvin Carter called me and said, after the horrific St. Paul shooting, what can be done to the people who put these guns on our streets? Mayor Carter, we're going to do this and we're going to do more. Mayor Fry, you can bet we're with you. <clears throat> because of this call, we are ready to go upstream in our efforts to help keep communities safe. Of course, the last four years have shown us that we don't know what will happen in the next four years. But whatever they bring, I pledge to you that every decision that we make will be based on helping you and your family thrive in this economy and in this society and in this world. Because everybody counts and everybody matters, no exceptions. I want <clears throat> As I take my seat again, I want to thank, because today is a day of thanksgiving, and I want to thank the people of the state of Minnesota for giving me the honor of serving as their attorney general. I'd like to thank my staff at the attorney general. I have never had a better group of people to work with. I am so honored by my colleagues. I want to thank the people who helped me and guided me and gave me advice along the way. They're so numerous to mention, but I see my friend Dick Allen in the, in, the, in the room tonight. Good to see you, Dick. And I'd also like to especially thank my family, including my wife, Monica Hurtado, who's here today, and my family, including my children, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Amir, Elijah. And I'd like to thank all of my family members, my sister-in-law who's here today. So many came, and I'm grateful to you all. And of course, Ng, where's Ng? Is Ng here? There she is. I want to thank all of you. And I want to thank, I want to thank my good friend, Imam Makram el Amin, who was here, who gave such a wonderful invocation for us. And I also want to thank uh, Jerry Blackwell, who uh, is now completed his first official act as a judge. But mostly, as I take my seat, I want to thank my mom who was here with us four years ago, who at 82 years young, was full of life, full of excitement, and looking forward to the future. Mom, we're looking toward, forward to the future right now, and we're gonna grab it, and we're gonna take it to new heights, like never before. Thank you. And now I would like to invite State Auditor Julie Blaha, along with your family, and Assistant Chief Judge Sarah Gruing to the stage for the State Auditor's Oath of Office. your right hand and repeat after me. I, Julie Blaha, do solemnly swear. I, Julie Blaha, do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will discharge faithfully. And that I will discharge faithfully. The duties of the Office of State Auditor. The duties of the Office of State Auditor. To the best of my judgment and ability to the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations.
I can thank my family right now. Can we just hear it again for my wonderful family, my grandkids and my husband? I am so excited to be here today. And I can tell you that as I was writing this speech, I got more than a little bit nervous. Uh, when I looked at this, uh, this program, I realized I was going to have to follow my fellow constitutional officers, these visionaries, these pioneers, these champions. Let's hear it again for the people that I get to serve with. I have to follow faith leaders who, who connect us with the eternal. I had, I, Nick is saying what I'm saying. Uh, this is so amazing. Uh, but I have to follow the poet laureate. Uh, so how does an auditor do that? Well, let's talk about the water treatment plant. Let's talk about the pension fund. Let's talk about snow plows. You know, usually in these situations, I say some numbers to get some people's attention. As you know, I oversee uh, over $60 billion in government spending. But as much as I love talking about our investigations, our support, our, uh, our analysis, it's ultimately about the everyday things that make our lives work. And, and you know, those things deserve as much pomp and circumstance as anything. You know, the fact that your neighbors ensure that the water came on this morning without you thinking about it, well, that is wonderful. That the pension fund made sure we had enough EMTs so they can be on the scene in time. And I'll tell you, if you've ever seen a first responder say, serve your family, uh, I'm sure that will get you in touch with your faith. Uh, and many of us have learned to thank the heavens when the snow plows come so the kids can get to school and we don't have to figure out how to manage a snow day. Uh, and the poetry in my work, I think, was summed up when I was a kid. I mean, there was just nothing more poetic when I was growing up than being able to fly down the big hill in front of my house on my bike with my best friend. And I could do that all because my mom and my dad worked with the township to get our roads paved, and the dust didn't keep my friend with asthma inside. So those hundreds of Minnesotans being sworn in this week in county seats, in city halls, in township meeting rooms all over the state, that's what makes my heart sore. So, uh, in fact, everybody here who has ever served in local government, could you please stand right now? All of you, city council, school district, counties, everybody, let's hear it for these people. Keep our world running. Thank you. And that's why I can't wait to get back to work ensuring that they all have the oversight, the support, and the data they need to be successful. I'm going to keep re advocating that the resources we send to the local level keep up with our growing needs and inflation. That our local oversight goes as far as it needs to go so that we can protect the trust and ensure we don't lose resources to waste or abuse. But not so far that it blunts creativity or innovation. That we make sure that our local matters truly matter that they get the attention that the vital services they provide deserve, and that our local leaders get the kind of data that they need to make decisions based on facts and decisions that can cut through division, that can just work. You know, and I also want to make sure that the incredible team at the Office of the State Auditor, who, for, who compliment, I get compliments on every single day, get to keep their focus on the people who make things happen locally. That is going to be what we want to do. And I'll tell you what, I, I can't thank you all enough. I want to thank my family, my friends, my supporters, and everyone else who got me in here. And I'll tell you, when you win by 8,425 votes, you really owe it to everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And what's wonderful about that is it reminds us that, you know what, we still have division. Things are still close, but it forces us to make sure that we are reaching out and connecting. And if you are struggling to connect, bring it local. You know what, if you're at that family gathering and you're fighting and arguing about a national issue, you know what, you can bring people together with a local issue, whether it's about making sure every kid in your school gets lunch, whether it's to make sure that you have the roads that can get you to the hospital safely, whether it's because of your unified hatred of roundabouts, whatever it takes, <laughs> when in doubt, look local. That is where the opportunity is and the action is. Let's hear it for that. Yeah, let's hear it for that. <laughs> 
I am so excited to get back to work on focus on the local life-changing projects we all rely on. So when you are ready to put your dream together out there with your neighbors, know that the Office of the State Auditor is ready to help you make those dreams real. I am humbled to be trusted with this important role, and I will work every day to be the auditor that Minnesota deserves. Thank you. Yeah. You may want to try some stand-up at the Acme Comedy Store. Eh? <laughs> Pretty good stuff there. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Congratulations. I would like now to invite Associate Justice G. Barry Anderson and Secretary of State Steve Simon and family to please rise for the oath of office. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, Steve Simon. I, Steve Simon. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. To support the Constitution of the United States. To support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And to discharge faithfully. And to discharge faithfully. My duties as Secretary of State. My duties as Secretary of State. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you all. Thank you for being here. It's a privilege to be with you here today. Four years ago, we, the same five constitutional officers, took the oath of office in this theater and on this stage. What a difference four years makes. Things seem very, very different now, don't they? Very different indeed. The events of the last four years challenged us and in some ways changed us. The same can be said of all Minnesotans. Just think of what we've all been through together these last four years. The COVID crisis at its peak demanded a lot from us. And in too many cases, it took a lot from us. There was no instruction manual. There was no template. There was no guidebook for how to do things during a once in a century pandemic. All of us, not just public officials, all of us had to adapt. We had to improvise. We had to just figure it out. And that is exactly what we did. As Secretary of State, I like to say that I'm in the democracy business. <laughs> it has in, it's a business that has endured quite a stress test these last few years. And we in Minnesota didn't just pass that test, we aced that test. In 2020, we faced fear and uncertainty in our election system. We faced the possibility of conflict and chaos, but Minnesota once again led the nation. We removed obstacles from the path of all eligible voters, and we made absolutely sure, absolutely sure, that no voter ever would have to choose between their health and their right to vote. In the end, we overcame the challenges and we succeeded. And we were once again, number one in America in voter turnout. But the aftermath of the 2020 election gave us another crisis, the emergence of dangerous election disinformation, which is really just a fancy word for lies. 
the willful distortion of the facts to undermine well-earned confidence in our elections. That disinformation inspired a deadly attack on the U.S. Capitol, and it inspired attacks on the freedom to vote in state capitals around our country. It remains the biggest threat to our democracy. We'll need to keep fighting back against it in the years to come. Through it, we have learned once again that democracy is fragile. It is easy to lose. And ironically, it can seem hard to practice. Some people view it as messy and slow. And as you know, in too much of the world, they're heading in the opposite direction, embracing strong men and muzzling the voices of the people. The good news is that in 2022, people across America in state after state after state said no to poisonous disinformation and conspiracy theories. And instead, Americans said yes to a vision of democracy that is inclusive and accessible and secure. So in 2022, we turned a corner. Democracy was on the ballot, and Minnesotans spoke clearly. They sent us a message, and they gave us direction to build on Minnesota's success story. We know what works in Minnesota. We know what works. This is not a mystery. We know that more voices that are heard, the better off we all are. <laughs> Going forward, Going forward, that means strengthening our democracy by protecting and expanding the freedom to vote, by enacting reforms that will move us forward and make us even better. Reforms that are nonpartisan in origin and in effect. Things like automatic voter registration. Yay. Things like pre-registration for high school students. And, and things like restoring the right to vote to those who have left prison behind. <laughs> but as you know, making our democracy better is about more than just passing bills in the legislature. It's also about connecting with one another across party lines, across county lines, across racial lines. It takes courage to connect especially with people we may have been led falsely to believe that we don't have anything in common with. I want to do my part. So I'll say again that I will work with anyone of any political affiliation from any background from any part of our state to protect, defend, and strengthen the freedom to vote in Minnesota. I am a long-term optimist. Does democracy seem a little bit dinged and dented over the last few years? Yes, absolutely it does. But democracy held. And democracy will continue to thrive in Minnesota if we don't take it for granted and if we keep confronting the threats to its health. I am truly honored and proud to be able to serve for another term as Minnesota Secretary of State. I'm thankful for my family. Especially uh, my late parents, my sister, my wife Leah, and our children Hannah and Noah for their love and support. <laughs> I'm grateful to the best staff of any Office of Secretary of State in the nation, bar none. I am grateful, last but not least, to the people of Minnesota for their vote of confidence. I will do my best to deserve it. Four years is a long time. A lot can happen in that space to a person, to a state, to a country. I hope that when we look back four years from now, we'll be admiring a democracy that is even stronger, even more accessible, even more secure, a democracy worthy of Minnesota's greatness. It's up to us 
The work starts now. Thank you very much. And now, please welcome to the stage Rabbi Marsha Zimmerman of Temple Israel. There is a Jewish proverb that says, the best guide is the human heart. The best teacher is time. The best book, the world. The best friend, a higher power divine presence in one's life. King Solomon had a dream in Kings 1, 3, 12 where God came to Solomon and said, what do you desire for your leadership, King Solomon? And King Solomon said, I would like an understanding heart in order to judge and discern, to know what is right and wrong, to separate the innocent from the guilty an understanding and wise heart was exactly what God gave to King Solomon in that dream. And we know King Solomon is the epitome of wisdom and righteousness and understanding and discernment. And so to these constitutional officers, to the state of Minnesota, we bless you with a deep and abiding, understanding heart. It will be your best guide. To know that time is the best teacher. To know that the world and the state of Minnesota is the best book. And that there is something beyond you personally. There is one Minnesota. There is a desire to see something beyond yourselves to the common good. That will be your best friend. And so as we go forth, I give you this prayer that is in the book of Numbers. This prayer that is given in many traditions. Yivarechecha Adonai v'yishmarecha May a higher power bless you and keep you. Ya'er Adonai panave lecha v'yechuneka. May a divine presence guide you and be gracious unto you. Yisa Adonai panav elecha v'yasem lecha shalom. May the divine presence guide you and most of all grant you personal, professional, as a public servant, the wider to peace, shalom, salam, peace, and wholeness. Amen. And now, please welcome to the stage Robert Robinson, accompanied by Sam Reeves. They will perform Imagine by John Lennon.
Imagine there's no heaven It's easy if you try No hell below us Above us only Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no countries. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to kill or die for And no religion to Imagine all the people
And now please welcome to the stage Father Dale Kurogi of the Church of the Ascension. St. Margaret Mary Alacoque, a 17th century French visitation nun and mystic, said that the heart of Jesus Christ is an abyss filled with all blessings into which the poor should submerge all their needs, an abyss of joy in which the suffering can immerse their sorrows, an abyss of mercy for the broken, an abyss of love to meet our every need. Jesus' spacious and all-embracing heart, his tender and loving heart, his self-sacrificing, reconciling, and impassioned heart, was fueled by his relationship with the one whom he called Father, who in turn called him my beloved. That one, while holding together all the universe, also held Jesus always and forever in the face of anything and anyone who might threaten to take him down. To that same strong and loving one, we pray today for our servant leaders. To you, Father, Mother, Creator, Allah, Adonai, Great Spirit, Gitchi Manadu, Presence, Goodness, Higher Power, God, we entrust to you those who rededicate themselves to generous service. Hold them, your beloved, always and forever. Nurture in them, we pray, wisdom and compassion, the wisdom of a broad mind and deep spirit, and the compassion of a big heart. Thank you, Father Dale. I now have the uh, distinct privilege of introducing my St. Louis Park neighbor and Minnesota's 50th Lieutenant Governor, Peggy Flanagan, who will be sworn in, who will be sworn in by Judge Sarah Wheelock. Lieutenant Governor, family, please join me on stage. Flanagan. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And the Constitution of the State of Minnesota. And that I will discharge faithfully. And that I will discharge faithfully the duties of the office of Lieutenant Governor of the State of Minnesota, the duties of the office of Lieutenant Governor of the State of Minnesota, to the best of my judgment and ability, to the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations.
am sh I am shorter than Mark Rosen. Well, I'm excited, too, to have Mark Rosen here, a fellow St. Louis Park native with a small n. Get it? Okay. And thank you so much to my sister in justice, Judge Wheelock, for swearing me in. And thank you to the family of the late Reverend Marlene White Rabbit Helgamo for loaning me Marlene's Bible on which I took the oath of office. And thank you to my amazing husband, who is my local celebrity crush, and I got to marry him. <laughs> and thank you to my amazing, my amazing little Anishinaabe Kwe Siobhan, who inspires me every day. I love you both so much. <laughs> and thank you, Minnesota, Chimi Gwetch. It's an extraordinary honor to continue serving as your Lieutenant Governor. When Governor Walls and I took this stage four years ago, none of us could have imagined what was before us. It's been a time of tremendous opportunity and tremendous loss, of hard work and sacrifice, of recognition and reconnection, and hopefully, of reconciliation. To quote, pardon me, but as Minnesotans, we have endured hard winters before. And to quote one particularly notable Minnesotan, it's so cold, it keeps the bad people out. <laughs> and so when temperatures drop and the snowdrifts pile up, Minnesotans dig in literally and figuratively. We deliver hot dishes, not casseroles, and we plow driveways. It's another snowplow reference, State Auditor. We care for one another. And when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, we protected each other. Frontline workers showed up every day. We sewed masks and ordered takeout and stayed apart so we could keep each other safe. And despite these challenges, over the past four years, we increased cash assistance for working families for the first time in 33 years. We invested in capital projects led by and for communities of color and native communities for the first time. We worked in partnership with our tribes and the legislature to codify tribal consultation and so much more. And so when times are hard again and again, we turn to one another. We turn to our values. We turn to the future that we want to build for ourselves and for our children. We are missing two people today. Four years ago, when I took the oath of office, I was joined on this same stage by my dad, Marvin Manny Penny, and my mom, Pat Flanagan. I told you how my story was a one Minnesota story about building a pathway for a little Anishinaabe girl from St. Louis Park who ate free and reduced price lunch and whose life was saved by Medicaid to grow up and become the first Native American to hold statewide office in Minnesota. who I am, a lifelong advocate for children and families, the highest ranking Native woman elected to executive office in the country, the Lieutenant Governor of Minnesota, 
because of the people who believed in me most, my family, my mom. My mom and dad both died during our first term, but I can feel them every day. They are here today in a different way in this space. And the values and the lesson they instilled in me are part of their legacy. Because that's also part of One Minnesota. The pathways that we build and the legacies that we leave. I am joined by my daughter, Siobhan, a fiery advocate in her own right, who soon will be 10 years old. It is for her and for kids like her that I do this work. We have a responsibility to those who came before us and to those who will come after us to leave a better world than we, the one we found. Imagine, if you will. As we enter our second term, I find myself reflecting on the legacies that we create and continue. We have an opportunity to continue shaping a government that works across lines of difference to better address the needs of the people that we serve. A government that includes people with lived experience at the decision-making table to tell us what they need. From young women and gender expansive youth who partner with us in the Young Women's Initiative to hiring consultants with lived experiences of homelessness to guide our work of policymaking through the Minnesota Interagency Council on Homelessness. We can build a government that invests in things that matter most, education and economic opportunity and housing and caring for our earth and our water, health and safety and our children and our families. A government that believes that Minnesotans can make their own decisions about how and when and if to start a family. And a government that looks more and more like the people of Minnesota with each passing election. And a government where everyone and I mean everyone, including, but especially, our LGBTQ plus friends and family and our young people can show up as their full, beautiful, whole, authentic selves and be safe and loved every single day. And while it shouldn't take an Ojibwe woman in office to do better by our 11 sovereign tribal nations that share geography with Minnesota, I am incredibly proud of our partnership with tribal leaders and that a significant part of mine and the governor's legacy is building a lasting infrastructure to keep doing what is right long after we leave office. It matters that we're here. I am here because of people like Hubert Humphrey and Walter Mondale and Nellie Stone Johnson, because of people like Representative Susan Allen and Skip Finn, because of the late Senator Paul Wellstone, because of my grandmother, Mary Hartman, because of my mom, Pat Flanagan, and because of former Lieutenant Governor and now Senator Tina Smith. Because of Mr. Redmond, my speech teacher in ninth grade, who is here in the audience right now. Because of everyone who has hired me and taken a chance on me, taken me under their wing and taught me and believed in me, and because of my family and my parents, but more importantly, I am here for young people like my daughter. I am here for children who are counting on us to build a better future. I am here for everyone who has felt like they were not seen or heard or valued or believed. We see you. We hear you. 
we value you and we believe in you. This is your Minnesota. And I am here to hold the door wide open for those who come after me. It is the honor of a lifetime to serve the people of Minnesota with my dear, dear friend and my favorite coworker, Governor Tim Walz. And it is an honor to be able to do this work with an incredible team of staff and the incredible family of Governor Tim Walz, First Lady Walz, Gus and Hope. We were in this together four years ago and we signed up again. And I'm so grateful to be doing this work, our families together. So the governor um, asked me last year, he hit me in the arm. He does that. If you know Tim Walls, he'll hit you in the arm. And he said, if you knew now, if you knew then what you know now, would you have signed up? And my answer was and is absolutely. Let's get back to work, Minnesota. Get Shimi Gwich. Thank you. This has been uh, for me uh, thanks to this man. Uh, yes, finally, I'd like to introduce someone who's a teacher, a coach, 24 year veteran of the National Guard, 10 year member of the United States Congress, and Minnesota's 41st governor, Tim Walls. I would like to invite you to the stage alongside Jonathan Judd, the first black judge for the 7th Judicial Co District to administer the oath of office. Governor. I, Tim Walls, I, Tim Walls, do solemnly swear or affirm, do solemnly swear or affirm, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and the Constitution of the State of Minnesota, and that I will discharge faithfully, and that I will discharge faithfully, the duties of the Office of Governor, the duties of the Office of Governor, to the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. As my large extended family leaves the stage, uh, you can tell what's important. I have deep debt of gratitude for everyone who was up here. Uh, thank each and every one of you. Being a, 
a couple decade long teacher i can see that eighth period stare if you've been sitting here all this time so uh so i want to say how grateful i am and, and a thank you to all minnesotans um it's an honor of my life to be your governor and i'm humbled to have the opportunity to do this again for four more years i'll do my very best to serve you well as you've heard all of the constitutional officers say at this occasion four years ago when we took the office we didn't know the extraordinary challenges, the unprecedented things that would befall the state. But I remember the feeling in that room that day four years ago. I believed in you, Minnesota, and you believed in us. And from that, we not only weathered those historic challenges, we've come out stronger and more committed to a future that includes all of us than ever before. We have a historic opportunity. Let me, let me, uh, let me thank Judge Jonathan Judd. Uh, a special thank you to Mark Rosen. And Mark, let me, on behalf of nearly 6 million Minnesotans, congratulate you and Karin on your recent engagement. We're excited for you. So, you know you're famous when you're like Minnesota sweethearts and they have the story in the paper and they're telling it. So uh, we are grateful. Um, a special thank you to all who have taken part in this ceremony. This is not in my speech, but as I think as you sit here and you think about living in the moment and being present, I hope Minnesotans and all of you that are here and are listening saw yourself reflected on the people in this stage, the sense of who we are as a state, the sense that you belong here. When you hear inclusion, and it some gets thrown on, it's very simple. It's a very simple thing. It's being embodied right in front of you today. I'll take a point of personal privilege that during the pandemic, the team of Nick and Patty, who are ASL interpreters, kept Minnesotans informed, kept Minnesotans included. <laughs> kept... I... People would run into me during the pandemic and say, oh, you're that guy with Nick. And um, yeah, says Nick. But tell me, if you want to see inclusion modeled for you, watch Robert and Nick sing Imagine to you and all Minnesotans feel that they are part of that. That's inclusion. So thank you to everyone who made that happen. To the members of our state and federal judicial branch, thank you for being here and for your service to our state and nation. I want to congratulate my fellow constitutional officers who said it all. We've been through a lot together. But I especially want to congratulate the people of Minnesota for sending these incredible public servants back to do this work. Thank you for that. Again, it, it can never say it enough. To the cabinet members who serve, you've watched this. They've been thrust into the public light. They are serving the people of Minnesota. They're not elected. And they were asked to tackle problems that had never been faced before on a global scale. And they did it with great dignity and with great passion and with great success. So to my cabinet and to the staff, on behalf of myself and a grateful state, thank you for your service to Minnesota. <laughs> and to Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, um, it's pretty obvious we're a team. We were friends long before we did this work. Some of you know the story that uh, I was trying to figure out how you run for office. So like a good teacher, you take a class. They teach you how. Um, my teacher was Peggy Flanagan. Um, that worked out pretty good. It's for her, <laughs> her guidance, her courage, and her friendship. She is truly a role model for everyone across the state, myself included. And just like all Minnesotans going about over these last terrible, difficult years, personal tragedy beset them. And as you heard, Lieutenant Governor um, lost a beloved older brother and lost both her parents. Um, I know they're all proud of you this day too, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, as the state is. So our hearts are with you. Um, this will not surprise anyone of busy. Our senior Senator Amy Klobuchar was here because of course she's everywhere. and. Um, but I believe she had to go back to D.C. I just want to make sure I express this, how incredibly grateful I am for the partnership and friendship that Senator Klobuchar has given to our administration. 
Somewhere out here, former Governor Jesse Venturi is here. Governor, <laughs> Governor, I have enjoyed getting to know you, and I appreciate your independent and very candid advice on part of this. Only, only a former governor and only Jesse Ventura can give that, and the state of Minnesota has benefited from that advice. Thank you, Governor. Um, also, I'd like to say, uh, former Governor Alqui's son, Joel, is here. Um, those of you who go back, I, I would just ask you, go back and read some of the things that Governor Kui did when he was in office in the late 70s. Uh, look what his life looked like and his family life looked like. Uh, the Kui family is an inspiration to Minnesota, and I want to thank Joel and the Kui family for giving me the privilege a few months ago of being able to celebrate with Governor Kui and the family his 99th birthday. So uh, we look forward to 100. And I look out here to the leadership of our 11 sovereign nations. Thank you for your partnership. Thank you for your advice. Thank you for your friendship. As we work as peers, government to government relationships to build better lives for all of our people. We know that history, and it's long, has not done this right. Our charge, as the Lieutenant Governor said, is to change those relationships forever going forward and codify the sovereignty of our 11 tribal nations. So I want to thank them. And legislators, thank you for dragging yourselves here to this. <laughs> Congratulations on your election. Um, we know we've got bold agenda and a lot of work to do, and I'm grateful. But I want to take a moment, uh, a special thank you to Speaker of the House, Melissa Hortman. Um, The state of Minnesota and I as governor could not have asked for a better leader over the last four years. Your compassionate, pragmatic, and tireless leadership have moved our state forward. I am incredibly grateful. Can't wait for what we're going to do together. But I can tell you this, history will look favorably on the work of you, Madam Speaker. Thank you. hardest job in the states. You know the herding cats? Well, herd Democratic cats. So well done. Well done. And to new incoming Majority Leader Dietzik, congratulations on your election. I am incredibly eager to partner with you in the years to come. Congratulations to you. Well, you, you saw this big family come up here, and I'll have to say, uh, my deepest thanks um, to Gwen, my wife, Minnesota's first lady. Um, our we have stories, I can tell you. Our, uh, our journey started in our commitment to service. Probably shouldn't surprise anyone. Our shared values and vision of a world that we wanted to create, not just for our children and our nieces and nephews, but for all children. I'm grateful for your sage advice, your acumen, your proofreading, your never attend ending attention to detail. You wrote that line too, that's good. So no, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Gwen, thank you for sharing your incredible family. Val and Lynn, your sisters and my brother-in-laws, I cannot tell you and I don't know how they go through it. Just imagine uh, the number of times their coworkers don't know who they're related to and have to hear those conversations. So I wanna thank you all for that. Um, to Hope and Gus, I can't tell you how proud I am to be your dad. I also want to acknowledge um, how difficult it must be to have me as your dad for numerous reasons, certainly, certainly over the last four years. But I can't tell you, watching your maturity, your intellect, your compassion, your generosity, and above all else, your humor. Um, thank you for sharing our family with Minnesota. I know that hasn't always been easy, but I am so looking forward to how you'll carve out your niche of service all on your own as your very own people. So thank you both.
And of course, I'm still incredibly blessed, and I, I, I think about it daily. Um, my mom is still here, and she's right here today with me, my mom, Darlene. Um, yay. We lived in a small town, as many of you know, about 400 people or so. Um, and when my dad died, I watched my mom work tirelessly to hold our family together. My dad was a Korean warrior veteran. He was an educator, and he was about a four-pack-a-day smoker who died of lung cancer when I was a teenager and my little brother was eight. I watched as my mom struggled enormously to pay outstanding medical bills and keep the family together. We got by on Social Security survivor benefits and my mom's job working as an aide in a nursing home. Mom, your hard work and courage was a powerful example for me in my life, and I thank you for that. She also raised four teachers, three of us married teachers, education's in our blood. Gwen and I met while we were teaching high school. We taught together for many years after we were married. We saw firsthand the challenges our students face. While we were in the classroom or coaching football or organizing dancers or directing plays, Gwen and I got to note our students deeply, and we understood their hopes and dreams and obstacles in their lives. It was my experience as a teacher and my passion for education that led me to ask Minnesotans to give me a chance to be their governor. Education can truly be the great equalizer. Minnesota has some of the best schools in the country, but there are disparities that we desperately need to address to ensure that every child receives a quality education and is given that equal opportunity to succeed. Kids carry their whole lives with them as they come into their classroom, their hopes, their dreams, their wisdom, their humor. They also carry their stress of hunger, housing, mental health and family challenges that stand in their way of success. And we know their future starts taking shape long before they get to the classroom, starting even before birth. Their future and their opportunities already start to unfold. Early childhood education, access to health care, and economic security help set a positive course on their young lives. My mission as governor is simple, to make Minnesota the best state in the country for kids to live. This is what I've charged my team to do to make our state the best place to raise a family, and I'm proud to say we've made historic strides. Over the past four years, in a bipartisan manner, we've made significant investments in health, health care, early education, and K-12 schools. We have formed, we've formed public-private partnerships to address housing and homelessness, we partnered with our healthcare systems and philanthropic community to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic and to improve mental health care. We bridged the urban-rural divide to rebuild critical infrastructure that benefits all Minnesotans in all corners of the state. We've championed child care and early learning programs. We've lowered the cost of insulin and prescription drugs, and we've cut taxes for small businesses and the middle class. We were recently ranked among the very top states on overall well-being and we've achieved the lowest unemployment rate of any state in the history of our country. We did those things during a global pandemic, during a racial reckoning, during an economic crisis, and during some of the most divided political times that any of us have ever seen. And we made progress, but we all know there's more work to be done. Across the country, the pandemic disrupted the lives of our students. And despite the heroic efforts of teachers, students, and parents, many of our kids have fallen behind. We've redoubled our efforts with summer catch-up programs, but there's a lot more to do. Let me be clear about this. The burden is not on our children and students, and it's not on our teachers. The burden to catch them up is on all of us. And we will do it. During this next coming legislative session, we will make the largest investment in public education in our state's history. We will, 
We will pass universal meals to ensure that every student is giving something to eat and no one carries a lunch ticket. We will fund special education to make sure when we say every child, we mean every child has the resources to succeed. We will put mental health front and center. We'll work together to eliminate stigma and allow our young people to access all of the help they need to reach their full potential. And just so all of you are wondering, sometimes you give these up here and you're kind of wondering and saying, well, you know, I don't know if the legislature or whatever. The legislature has the same priorities. The legislators are talking the same way. So this is not a list of nice to have things. These are a list of things that we will do for the children and the families of Minnesota to improve their lives. We will fund programs to recruit and train the next generations of teachers so a diverse generation of students has an equally diverse generation of teachers. And with absolute certainty, and I look forward to the day to sign this bill, we will ban conversion therapy to ensure that every student... Every To our LGBTQ plus students, you are beautiful and perfect just the way you are. But our plans are bigger. Investing in the classrooms are just the start. Building the best schools in the nation is a good start. But to make Minnesota the best state for kids, we need to make sure that kids are thriving in and out of the classroom. Children can't learn if they're hungry or if they're homeless. We have the opportunity to ensure that every child has a safe place to call home, and no child goes hungry. My pledge to you on this day is, I am committed to ending child poverty in the state of Minnesota. In the coming weeks, in the coming weeks, we will announce a bold new proposal to lift up our children, our youth, and our families in Minnesota and put them at the very center of the state budget. Success in the classroom is paramount, but we've got work to do that ensure that every family has access to affordable health care, child care, early education, economic security, and again, not a nice-to-have thing, something we will get done together that every family has access to paid family and medical leave. When we invest in our children, when we invest in our families, we are investing in the future. So when you hear about where is Minnesota going to go, where is the workforce going to come from, where are the entrepreneurs going to come from, where are the nurses, where are the teachers going to come from, we are going to create a state that makes sure that no child gets left out of that dream and no child is left off the tools to get that done. So the critical resources that shape these lives will shape generations to come. I want to make sure that families continue to move here and that all families have the opportunity to succeed. I want it when people hear about Minnesota. Minnesota is a state where everyone's included. Minnesota is a state that's looking towards the future. Minnesota is a state that values their children. We care for them. We house them. We feed them. We educate them. And we lift them up for who they are. So when I hear people talk about what is the future, the economics look like, what are these happening, we're aging, we're doing those things. That's all correct. The answer sets right in front of us. Let's make sure those children know there's no place better to live and there's no place better than they want to be than right here in the state of Minnesota. So I think about my family and I think about the people who invest in us. I've been saying for many, many years, I hear people say, we know how to work. Families know how to hard work. You know all the sayings that get sent when people are struggling, but I want to be very clear. Our family had no problem pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. We just didn't have any boots. 
Those are programs that invest, like Social Security survivor benefits, help to make college more affordable, Pell Grants and affordable tuition, job training programs. My pledge to you is that every family here, I will invest in you and your family, no matter who you are or where you live, to make sure that Minnesota does truly become one Minnesota. We'll continue to lower health care costs, prescription drug costs, make sure, as I said with my mom and dad, and let's give workers an opportunity in this tough climate right now. I know that there's going to be some things we're going to have to work out at the legislature, but let's send a little money back in the form of a check to families so they can have a little spending money if we can. I'd like to try and do that. Let's grow our workforce. Let's attract folks here. Let's make sure that we are a destination place for teachers, for nurses, for small business owners, for entrepreneurs. Let's make sure this is the place when they talk about where can you feel included and where can you thrive. Minnesota needs to be the first thing they say. Let's do it by being bold. Let's invest in clean energy jobs, grow our economy, manufacturing solar panels and the infrastructure necessary for uh, to support electric vehicles right here. And I'm not talking about any jobs. I'm talking about making sure we protect the right to collectively bargain so that highly skilled union jobs are the ones that we work on. While we're at it, let's make our electricity carbon free by 2040 in that mission. Let's improve public safety. Let's improve public safety. And as you heard the Attorney General talk about, making sure people have the freedom to not be shot or to not be involved in that. So let's do things that all of us know and the vast majority of Minnesotans uh, support. Let's pass common sense gun legislation to make it more. And we can make sure that prosperity extends across the state. Let's make sure communities all across Minnesota have equal access to health care, to child care, to high-speed Internet and educational opportunities. And let's go ahead and finish the work. And I want to point out and thank the Commissioner of uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, Larry Herkey. Minnesota is on track to become the fourth state to eliminate veterans' homelessness. We are down to those last ones. Let's just finish the job. And I'm going to echo, if, if I could tape it and play it over and over and over again, what Secretary Steinman said, let's continue to ensure that Minnesotans have the safest, most secure elections in the country. Let's strengthen the freedom to vote, and let's go ahead and pass that set of initiatives like automatic voter registration and all of the other things to make sure that happens. So. And we're told and we know the states are going to be the forefront of some of the biggest decisions in people's lives. The Supreme Court has decided that's the direction they're going. So I want to be very clear. Let's go ahead and here in Minnesota protect the right to choose when to start a family by codifying abortion access once and for all. So. Whether it's inside or outside that classroom, let's make sure that every one of those families has the chance to succeed. Now is the time to be bold, to build that bright future for Minnesotans, and now is the time to deliver. We can lead the nation in ending child poverty, making sure that every child receives that world-class education, and in doing so, we'll continue to make sure that Minnesota is the best place to raise a family. I have a positive vision for the future of this state, and it's rooted in my belief that we're all in this together. I still believe more than ever that we're one Minnesota. And I want to be clear, that doesn't mean that we're all the same, that we all agree, but it means we can work across lines of differences to do what's right and to do what's fair to make our state better for every single one of our people. As I look across this room, I see a lot of newly elected um, leaders. I believe almost a third of the legislature is going to be first time. Promising faces of our new majorities in the House and Senate, I'm feeling pretty optimistic. 
I'm looking at a state legislature on both sides of the aisle, though, that looks more like the people of Minnesota than at any time in our history. That gives me hope. It inspires me. And I look forward to working with everyone, Republican and Democrats alike. I will work with them to get things done. Minnesotans spoke clearly in this last election, and they expect all of us to do just that, get things done. The era of gridlock in St. Paul is over. <laughs> be clear. Be very clear. Minnesotans have chosen. They chose hope over fear. They chose fact over fiction. And they chose action over excuses. Our path is clear. It's time to lead. We've been given a historic opportunity, which comes with a responsibility to not miss it. Our mandate and our mission are this. Be bold and deliver for Minnesota. To every one of you who has been elected, be the decent, dedicated, diverse leaders that you were elected for. Be the ally and the role model and the change maker that your constituents need you to be. Work pragmatically. Go find someone you never thought you could accomplish something with and never thought possible. For about three years in Minnesota, we were the only place in the country that did that. That we worked across party lines, we had a divided legislature, and we sat down and worked out and made progress. That stalled. Minnesotans spoke. They want that work to be done. They want their lives improved. They want the things they believe in to be done. We're not here to score cheap political points. We're certainly not here for victory laps. We are here for one very clear and simple reason, to help improve lives. We have a moment, not about which party ones are in control. The moment is about the opportunity to work together to get things done. This is our opportunity to model what public service and public servants look like. This is an opportunity to make change, to make what was previously impossible possible, and to strengthen facing faith in government as a force for good. I've often said, and you heard some beautiful people of faith speaking up here, you don't need your governor to give a sermon, but you should dang sure expect me to try and live one. That's our opportunity. That's our opportunity to restore civility, transparency, accessibility to our decision-making tables for all Minnesotans, all ages, all races, all genders, all zip codes. This is our opportunity to truly build one Minnesota and to make our state the best place in the country to live, to work, and to raise a family. This is our opportunity. Let's get to work. May God bless you. Please welcome to the stage Pastor Jen Rome of Pilgrim Lutheran Church. The heart of God inhabits us. That God would come and be human in Jesus means so much to me and to the tradition I'm a part of. That God's heart would beat in a human heart, ache and break, and love and mend. Christ lived and labored in a complicated civic and political world. And in that reality with God, we are not alone. God knows what it's like. God knows the heart it takes to keep working every day for all people and all creation to live together justly, kindly, and well. God's heart beats with ours now. It's rhythm felt in and among us. 
God's heart soars when those experiencing need are cared for, when those who are being oppressed are lifted up, when true apologies are offered and healing begins, when work for a just and loving world is being done. I am holding our state of Minnesota and our leaders in my heart, carrying us around in prayer as I go about my daily life, as each of you goes about your daily life, as we go about our daily lives together, as the life of the earth unfolds, we carry each other around in our hearts. May powerfully compassionate and humbly just love inhabit the hearts of our leaders. And may such love pulse in our actions as a state, this term and beyond. Amen. And now let's welcome to the stage the Spirit Boy Singers to perform an honor song.
Well, Governor, thank you uh, very much for the honor of being here today. Uh, since you mentioned it, I'd like to acknowledge my new fiance, Karen, Yay. who is with me to here today and who has made my life and my heart whole again. Love you, honey. Thank you, everyone. You've been a wonderful audience. What a spectacular day. We would like to invite you to the Capitol uh, for an open house this afternoon from 2 to 4 p.m. Keep that in mind. And now I'd like to invite, again, the Minnesota National Guard 34th Infantry Division Red Bull Band Brass Quintet back to the stage to perform while we all say our long Minnesota goodbyes. <laughs>